I was telling everybody I thought this was a social experiment. You wanted to see whether I was going to shut up or start without <laughs> you. Or... No, no, no. Listen, I'm, I'm, I, we might as well get started now. Let's just launch right in. Uh, I'm really honored, and it's Thank a real you. pleasure to have you here. I uh, moderated the first L.A. County candidates debate for the office of L.A. County D.A. Um, over the California African American Museum about maybe a month ago, three yep. weeks ago now, and had an opportunity to hear George Gascon and Rachel Rossi discuss some of the issues and was so impressed by um, uh, George Gascon's command of the criminal justice issues that I thought that the class could benefit from, the students here could benefit from uh, a, a further discussion in which you're not limited by the 30 second, one minute, at most 90 second sound bites that you have to get out in a debate format a lot of times, which sacrifices much of the nuance and complexity, et cetera. And uh, these students at SC, if nothing else, they are masters of nuance and complexity Good. Um, after the training that we put them through. And they already come with very, um, with minds that are very subtle. So we just try to be a whetstone and, and sharpen them even a little bit more. Um, but let me uh, give a little background and then I want you to uh, share some of your thoughts, um, Mr. Gascon, because we fortunately, my seminar before we came in today got the benefit of some of his um, experience and words of wisdom. And I hope you won't feel too put upon to recapitulate some of that um, because I thought it was so helpful and sure. insightful in framing some of these questions. But what has, um, what this, I see this as a continuation of, I see Dan Simon, one of our great criminal law experts here. Good to see you, Dan. Um, one of the uh, things that's exciting to me about being here with talking to you is we've had Larry Krasner come through on two occasions now, last year, the year before that, and when he first got elected yeah. to Philadelphia as, and he, he might be the most iconic progressive prosecutor in America now, although, as I'm going to say in a moment, you really preceded him and I think may be the godfather of progressive prosecutors mm -hmm. in a lot of ways going back to 2011. But, the students here remember, some of the ones who are here now remember Larry Krasner coming through and what a jaw-dropping development it was for him to assume that office in Philadelphia. I could not have anticipated, outside of your election, um, I could not have anticipated a person who had never prosecuted a case in his life like Larry Krasner before he was elected had been a public defender and then a f defense attorney all his life, and ran on the following platform in cash bail, dress police misconduct, in mass incarceration, and get 75% of the voters of Philadelphia to right. support him in the general election on that platform. That was unthinkable to me five or 10 years ago. I would have bet the house on that not happening. Right. Outside of your election up in San Francisco, there were just very few. Um, uh, prosecutors who are elected with any kind of progressive pedigree or desires uh, going forward. So I'd like you first to give us some idea of how you got to the place that you were the prosecutor in San Francisco in 2011 because there's a, there's a path, an interesting path that got you there. And then what some of the challenges were, what some of the programs were that you brought in that were consistent with that moniker of being a progressive prosecutor. Uh, I think a lot of people, have, it's now become an almost empty buzz word. Yes. You know, there are people who claim the mantle of progressive prosecutor who have very little in the way of their records to right. support that particular right. claim. So could you give us just a little that, bit of that background? Yeah, sure. You know, just uh, very quickly, because I think it will put context for all of you as we engage in the conversation down the line. Um, you know, I grew up here in L.A. County. I grew up in an area called Catahay, which is a very uh, poor, blue-collar, uh, mostly immigrant area. Uh, I, I immigrated, my family immigrated from Cuba here. English was a second language. I dropped out of school early, 
uh, wound up going in the Army. I actually got my high school education and my early college education while I was in the Army. Uh, and then came back uh, home after I finished uh, with the Army, went to Cal State Long Beach, which is uh, not far from here, got a bachelor's degree in history uh, with the intent of teaching history. And you know, one thing led to another. I wound up becoming a member of the LAPD uh, and spent over two decades with the LAPD, rising through the ranks and becoming the number two running operations, which is basically at that time was all patrol and detective operations throughout the entire city. And I might just interject at this point that a lot of folks don't understand what the office of the head DA entails, right? Um, you really are a CEO. You really are an, uh, uh, an operational person as, as well as a lot of other things. We're talking about in Philadelphia, it was 300 DA attorneys. Here, it's closer to 1,000. Uh, a little more than 1,000, about 3,000 employees, about 1,200 lawyers right now. Right, yep. and, and, and that, that's the office you run, that, so I'm sorry. Yep. Just no, no, absolutely, it's the largest DA office in the country. So in 2006, you know, I, I, I decided that I, I wanted to, you know, I've gone as far as I could go with the LAPD at the moment. I got recruited, I wound up in Mesa, Arizona, which is a city within Maricopa County, and. Uh, there was a sheriff there, a guy named Joe Arpaio, who had developed a national reputation for being What was his name again? Joe Arpaio. Yeah, you remember him? Yeah. Uh, reputation for being America's toughest sheriff, also probably the most racist, the most anti-immigrant sheriff, uh, probably in history, at least that uh, people knew. Uh, we, uh, we immediately became embroiled in a big battle over uh, our philosophy about how policing and law enforcement should take place. Um, I spoke about the, the abuses, the human rights violations, the civil rights violations that were going on in Maricopa County regularly. Uh, took, that took me at one point to provide testimony to the U.S. Congress, and when I did that, I was asked to leave Mesa because I was bringing too much political heat. Uh, Gavin Newsom, who is the governor today, was the mayor of uh, San Francisco at the time. And he recruited me. I became the chief of police there. Then I uh, worked on uh, helping Kamala Harris, who was the DA at the time, become attorney general for the state. When she did, uh, I have been, you know, I obviously skipped a part of this. I have been a lawyer now for over 20 years. Um, I got appointed to be the DA and then got elected twice. Um, my focus from the very beginning when I became the district attorney is I had been working already at the national level for almost a decade on criminal justice reform, really with a very strong focus on reducing incarceration. That was really, at that point uh, in my life, that was really the goal. You know, my goal is much broader today, but you know, I, you, as you will see during the conversation, I, you know, I'm a product of evolving, obviously. Uh, so when I became the district attorney, I believe that, that we could find a, a balance between reducing crime and community safety and reducing incarceration. I think you could do both at the same time, and we proved that you could. Um, and that was the primary focus at the time. Um, and I think the received wisdom was that the two were mutually exclusive. You couldn't right. reduce crime and reduce mass incarceration or incarceration. You needed a punitive approach exactly. to reduce crime. Exactly. I think that people equated incarceration with public safety, which is actually the reverse. By the way, you, there's a small number of incapacitation that produces some level of immediate safety, and then you start, if you want to look at it in economic terms, you, you start losing your return on investment very quickly. Incarceration actually makes us less safe, not more safe. Uh, there are many reasons for that. Number one is 95% of all the people that get incarcerated get released and our prisons and, and jails are not a place where people rehabilitate or redeem themselves. It's a place where generally um, whatever criminogenic factors you went in with, you are guaranteed to multiply in multiple times. In fact, there are studies now that say that for every year of incarceration, uh, you have a four to, uh, I believe it's a four to seven percent increase of likelihood that you're gonna be rearrested. So you can see what a 10 year incarceration cycle would do for anyone. Um, you know, I'm also a strong believer in science and, and, and good data. And by the way, on data, I'm always, I always caution this with, say, good data because there's a lot of garbage data out there, mm -hmm. garbage in, garbage out. But I think mm -hmm. when you have science to support data, um, then you hopefully start walking the journey to a better, uh, better way of doing your business. So I, I came in already with that, that sort of the 
broad understanding that incarceration was something that we could reduce and still not impact public safety. Um, also, frankly, as Professor indicated, in 2011, I sat down with a friend of mine. We, I had been working with the Executive Sessions on Public Safety at the Harbor Kennedy School of Public Policy for years as a fellow doing a lot of work there. And, and, and we knew that there were, you know, the term progressive and prosecutors was not, they, they were not coming together. So when I- it Sounds I like an oxymoron. When I used to did. say it, it sounded like a contradiction in terms. In yeah. fact, some of our public interest law students were kind of a reluctant to consider the prosecution right. as a career path because it didn't seem like there was public spirit of things going on in there. Exactly. But you're, 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 Larry Krasner, I think, uh, convinced many of them that you can reconcile the two role, yeah. roles, but you've been doing it for a lot longer even than he, so could you right. talk more about that yet? Yeah, so we, we literally started looking at the map of the U.S., and we were trying to identify strategically what are the urban centers where is anybody that could be considered a progressive prosecutor. Um, you know, there were a couple of people that had been nibbling in some areas, but we just couldn't find one. So one of the conversations was then, uh, how do we go about creating a movement here, which actually eventually led to uh, Open Societies Foundation, which is a George Soros Foundation, uh, putting almost $50 million in 2014 through the ACLU to begin the movement. And you know, people like Larry Krasner and others came to my office while they were running for office. In some cases, we identified people to run for office. And then many would come in after getting elected. They send their people in. So like, for instance, Larry's number two, at one point spent almost a month going in and out of my office, right? So, you know, and we're learning from each other. In fact, I was telling Professor that actually Larry Krasner and Merrill Mosby are probably more responsible than anybody else for me being sitting here today because they're the ones that finally convinced my wife that we needed to do this. I really was not going to run for LADA. I was coming back home for personal reasons. I'm doing it because I believe in the mission, but more importantly, we're a lot of good people that, that we trust that, that convince us to do it. So as we engage in this journey, if you will, we're looking for ways to, to reduce the punitive impacts on the criminal justice system with a strong belief that the system should not be about punishment, right? Punishment is up to somebody else. It should never be up to government. Um, and you know the interventions that prosecutors provide should be the minimal necessary in order to accomplish the, the, the public safety objective of reducing the potential for additional harm, um, which you know again is very uh, is not usually what prosecutors and police believe their work is. So we began a, a the reward journey. system seems to be that you get more kudos, more accolades as a DA, the more punitive, the more tough on crime you can yep. appear, and this seems to be cutting against that grain. Exactly. exactly. So we started to develop a culture that, that started to speak over different things. So for instance, we, uh, when I won in the office, about 65% of our work was all drug related, a lot of hand-to-hand -hand sales. Uh, we basically dropped out to the mid-20s and we said we're going to concentrate on violent crime. This is the area that we're going to really, uh, and, and frankly there were political reasons for that also because I could not just simply say we're, we're going to turn the system upside down the first few days that I'm in office. You know, you had to progressively, a lot of things that are acceptable today in 2011 would have gotten me, uh, there would have been a recall two years after I was in office and I didn't want to get recalled because that doesn't get the work done. So we started to work on you know, going after, for instance, three strikes. That was the first thing that we did. I worked with Stanford Law School in 2012, and it was Prop 36, which was the uh, reform, a mild reform, but a significant one, basically. If you're going to go uh, to prison for 25 years to life, your third strike must be serious and violent. It cannot be stealing a loaf of bread. Uh, which was a second degree burglary at the time, and you go 25 years to life. And I know people say, well, that never happened. Well, it did. We had we have people in California prisons 25 years to life that have stolen a loaf of bread, have stolen a pizza. Uh, I'm not going to say that that was an overwhelming number, but there were some people that were there. And if you got one, it's too many, and there was certainly a lot more than one. Well, we, and we had a report, you can find it in the LA Weekly, of uh, incumbent DA uh, Jackie Lacey, um, bringing a prosecution against an 18-year-old uh, for going into an unoccupied car and taking a cell phone from its back seat. He had two prior purse snatching incidents when he was 16 and got 25 to life. Yep, yep, yeah. So we had those people. 
Um, in fact, there were right around 3,000 people roughly in the system that, that qualify for release under Prop 36. Interestingly enough, uh, in San Francisco, we released the ones that qualify within roughly about 45 days. We submitted in all the cases. Uh, in LA County, there's still people in prison today that qualify, should have been released seven years ago, eight years ago, they're still in prison today. They fight every single reform effort. Um, then we started looking at drug policy, and that was, uh, that was the genesis of Prop 47. Prop 47, actually, the earliest draft were done in my office, and we, we wanted to go after the, the disparity that you had, especially with uh, drug possessions. If you, own, if you had crack cocaine, that was automatically a felony. If you had part of cocaine, it was a wobbler. Most of the time, it was a white affluent person. They got a misdemeanor, or no, they got diversion. An African American with a small quantity of crack co cocaine got a felony conviction. Uh, and a lot of people were in, in prison because of those convictions. So that, that was Prop 47. Then we engaged in. Uh, um, Mr. Garcia, let me point out you know, something I think some students may not be aware of, and that is that the DA's office sets the law enforcement priorities. So when you're, say, uh, when you're saying that you stop going after the lower level offenses, like drug possession, say marijuana possession, or whatever those lower level offenses may be, that means the resources can be rechanneled toward the serious violent offenses. The reason we have rape kit backlogs, has anyone heard about rape, rape kit backlogs? The reason you have rape kit backlogs is because of perverted enforcement priorities. Mm -hmm. When you have police departments channeling their resources at turnstile jumpers. Testing a small quantities of yeah, drugs that yeah. ties up your lab. It means that they're not addressing some of these uh, more serious crimes yep. like rapes than they're having these pile up, these warehousing of these rape kits that should be addressed. They aren't being addressed and they can be addressed if the enforcement priorities exactly. allow you to shift your attention exactly. to those crimes. Yeah, yeah it, it's certainly, I mean, you're, you're as, a, as a district attorney, uh, you have, first of all, you have a great deal of discretion. You really decide what you're gonna do pretty much, but secondly, you decide by, by your decisions, you're, you're moving resources one way or the other, right? You have a, you have a finite level of resources. One of the things that I used to tell my prosecutors is before you decide to file a case, Remember, as soon as you file a case, there's a, whole, there's a whole train of things that start happening, right? You activate a, a defense. Most of the time, it would be a public defender, but even if it's a private defense counsel, uh, you're immediately going to start tying up court resources. You're going to be tying up uh, probation. You know, there's a lot of things. So it's not your decision actually triggers immediately uh, an impact that can be hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars sometimes uh, on, on a case. And obviously, then those resources are not available to deal with something else. Now, that might be the right decision, but you should at least entertain that that decision has, has an impact system-wide, right? Uh, so when you're like LA County, uh, you know, you're prosecuting people, for instance, for having a suspended driver's license or no driver's license, and you may say, well, you know, this is important for public safety. God knows our licensed drivers are going to be the, the end of the world. Uh, well, not only are you tying up court resources, but usually that car gets impounded, that person cannot go to work, they become unemployed, then they become homeless, and then we have other problems that they become mentally ill because they're homeless, I mean, you know. So thinking about all those things are really, really important, and unfortunately in our world prosecution, very seldom do those things uh, ever, do they ever play a role in the decision-making process. Mr. Gascon, what about a, a allocating those resources, targeting homeless people as part of your enforcement efforts, is, is that effective? You know, one of, one of the ways, one of the controversies we have in LA now is how do we address the home, the, or the houseless problem is what many people, right. many of the advocates in the community call it houselessness because they say we have a home, we just don't have a roof over our head. You know, we call LA home mm -hmm. um, and we're unhoused is primarily right. the problem. Yeah. But one of the approaches we've taken is to crack down on the down and out, to go after them with citations, to put them in cuffs, to put them in jail cells and say, the way that you can uh, get out of this particular legal embroilment is by going to a kind of 12 steps program in one of the mega shelters. And, and that's how we're going to address the homelessness problem through the kind of what they would call the velvet fist in the iron glove approach. 
if you will, right? Where it's coercive benevolence, it's therapeutic policing. We're doing this for your own good. We're cracking down on you for, for your own good. It, is your sense that that's an effective approach? Yeah, no, it's not. And, and I mean, there's a lot to unpack here. And I, and I, I really, uh, I hope that I um, generate maybe some discussion on this because I think there is a lot here. Number one, um, if you look at any serious science around this issue, uh, you come to the conclusion very quickly that you cannot force people into rehabilitation. You cannot force people into stop using drugs as much as you cannot stop people, force people into not having cancer or force people into not drinking alcohol, right? Uh, you hear the stories about the person that went to drug court and somehow they got cured. Uh, what you never hear is that a very small number of the people that would have qualified for drug court ever went to drug court, and you hear less that even a lower number actually uh, actually wound up with a good result. With the other side of the coin is you get people that keep rolling in and out of jail and getting worse. So any conversation around the care and the stick when it comes to homelessness, um, when it comes to mental health, when it comes to substance abuse, is completely moving away from science. Now, if you want to be punitive, if you think you can, you know, you can beat people over the head until you beat them into submission, then you go for it. But at least understand that that's what you're doing. And you know, there's a dangerous conversation that is going on right now about forced treatment, right? Uh, again, the evidence shows that forced treatment doesn't work. The other part that you have to consider, and I think when it comes to houselessness, it's really important. I don't know how many of you could be out on the street for an extended period of time without a home or a household or you know, a, a traditional house mm -hmm. uh, and not become someone that is going to have severe behavioral issues. I can tell you that I don't believe that I could survive a year on the streets. And I think after about 60 days, I will be yelling at you when you're walking by me because I will be pissed. All right? And if I'm there because it happens to be that a big contributing factor that happens to be the color of my skin, I'm going to be even angrier, right? And if it happens to be because I'm poor, I'm also going to be really pissed, right? So let's first of all be honest with one another because I know that often when we see houseless people on the street on their behavior problems and you know they haven't bathed for a while but guess what they don't have access to a bathroom and they may urinate in public but guess what they don't have any other place to urinate right as a bodily function and and we somehow think that we can somehow coerce them into getting fixed without first of all going to a basic human need that we have to provide housing first we're not gonna fix the problem, right? Mm -hmm. And then we think that, well, maybe if we force medicating so they're walking around like zombies and go back to the tent, but now they're harmless because like a zombie, well, that's not a society that I wanna live in. So you're gonna hear conversations right now, there's stuff going on about we're gonna create, we're not gonna take them to jail, we're gonna force them into treatment. But again, we go back to a law enforcement approach to this. It, you know, it kind of reminds me of the re-education camps in Russia, in Cuba, or even in Nazi Germany, right? That's, that's what we're really talking about. Now, people get offended. They get really, you know, queasy about this stuff. No, no, we want to be humane. This is going to be the, we're going to call it the Human Rehabilitation Act or some other bullshit. That's what it is, mm -hmm. okay? So let's call it for what it is because forced treatment is nothing more than walking away from our social responsibility to ensure that every human being has a roof over the head, and that roof doesn't happen to be a tent, right? And then when we do that, then we can talk about all the other services that are necessary, right? And then when we look at our houselessness conditions in this county and around this country, by the way, and look at how disproportionately it impacts African Americans mm -hmm. and people of color. And we have to ask, you know, we have to have a serious conversation about race in this country that we still continue not to have. I just interject here. Forrest Stewart, in his book, um, Down and Out and Under Down Out and Under Arrest, ethnographer, spent six years in Skid Row and traveling with LAPD, did the number breakdown. Seventy-five percent he found of the homeless, uh, homeless or houseless population in downtown LA are African American. That's the number he came up with. Seventy-five percent. 
countywide, you know, if you believe in homeless counts around 50%, so 7% of the population, about 50% are the people that are houseless, right? So, you know, there's a ton of stuff to unpack here, and I'm not going to walk away from here giving you the answers to the, you know, the problems, but I hopefully I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to poke you a little to think more uh, deeply about what the solutions are, because I can guarantee you the solutions are not forced treatment, the solutions are not law enforcement driven, the solutions are not prosecutorial driven, the solutions are how do we engage human services, how do we get to the core function that we as a society do not have enough housing, the housing should be a human right, not an option, not, you know, not a, a benefit. Um, you know, quite frankly, there I say that, you know, education and, and, uh, and uh, health services should be part of a human right, but I know that I'm probably not getting to be a heretic here for some of you. You know, other parts of the world, actually, these things are viewed as a human rights, right? If you walk into any place in the European Union, they would tell you part of being part of the European Union requires a housing, education, and health services are a human right. They're no longer a benefit. Right? So I'm fearful that we're having all this conversation because I get it. You know, the, the, the homeless person, the houseless person in front of your home, in front of your million dollar condo pisses you off. Right? They urinate on your front door. They defecate, you know, right by where your car drives in. Sometimes they give you a crappy look. They might break into your car. Um, God knows they may even punch you because they're angry and they're, you know, having a whole bunch. They're seeing now three-headed three monsters. And none of that is good. And I get all of that. But the solution is not warehousing them in some place so we don't have to see them, which is what we've done before, right? We just warehouse people. And we're warehousing people based often on race and the socioeconomic status, right? Which I believe is immoral and it's unethical, and we have to say it for what it is. And I know that you know, this makes people very, very uncomfortable. And frankly, a lot of people in my campaign say, shut up, don't talk about this stuff. <laughs> you don't want to talk about this stuff. Well, I'm going to talk about it, mm. right? Because if I'm going to get elected, what you see is what you get. Okay, I tell people I will evolve, I have evolved, right? I'm not the same human being that I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, neither are you. And I'm hoping to be a better person every day but I'm not perfect, and I make mistakes. So if I were to sit in front of you 10 years from now or five years from now, there may be some things that, you know, I may be in a different place. But hopefully, because there's a good intent here, intentionally trying to move forward. But what I will not do is tell you that I'm going to do something that I'm not going to do intentionally. I'm not going to be the one that is going to dance around this issue and tell you, oh, you know what, we can fix homeless, uh, you know, we, we take our little piece and we'll, we'll go out and we'll prosecute them, we'll beat them over the head, we'll make sure that they're all going to get better, because that's a bunch of crap, okay? The other part that we have to admit is that actually the criminal justice system creates homelessness, mm -hmm. right? A lot of the people that are houseless today are houseless because of criminal justice interventions. Criminal justice interventions like the the person driving without a license that all of a sudden takes the only vehicle that person has to go to work and they're actually uh, maybe in custody for two or three days and by the time they come back because these are people that are right at the edge of falling off the cliff, employment is gone, they don't have a job, they don't pay the rent and 60 days, 90 days down the line, the whole family is homeless, right? They don't have a house. Or the mentally ill that we continue to put in jail for a few days, by the way. You know, these people that go into L.A. County Jail with some quality of life stuff, I mean, they're not going to go there for years. They shouldn't go there at all. But, you know, if you want to sweep them under the rug or something, they're coming back to you, right? And we release them at about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning out of Boucher Street without mm -hmm. any place to go. And then they go back to the same place they got arrested or down the block. And then two or three days they get arrested again and we still haven't addressed the basic issue of housing and mental health, right? Rand just did a study on, on L.A. County Jail. 17,000 people, roughly 6,000 qualify for mental health diversion. Now, you have a DA that goes around talking about her mental health program. 30% of her work 
is dealing with people that have identified some mental health issues. She spends more on office supplies than she spends on her mental health unit. And if you talk to any line deputy district attorney, they would tell you that the, the direction is always to oppose mental health diversion. Always. First three months of last year, 26 people in LA County were given mental health diversion. How do I know that? Because we got a hold of a text message of a person from the DA's office that sent it to a county supervisor who was asking, well, how is this working? A county of 10 and a half million people. 6,000 people in jail qualify for mental health diversion. In three months, we give mental health diversion to 26 people by the DA's office. The rest of it happens in spite of the DA. They're opposing it, and judges decide to do it anyway, instead of them being part of the solution. Let me ask you this, um, Mr. Gascon. You have, took a progressive prosecutor's approach to the office in San Francisco, and a lot of people are worried that that kind of approach will lead to a spike in crime rates, increased crime. Did you? In your tenure there, was there an increase in crime? What does the crime look like now as against when you took office? And what are some of the programs that were, you found were effective? Were there any science-based programs that actually reduced recidivism and reduced the crime rate? Yeah, so let, let me tell you about the, the crime history and the comparison between LA County and San Francisco. During my tenure, and I'm going to use now Department of Justice numbers. Now, some people criticize UCR numbers because they say, well, they're inflated or whatever. What is the metric that we have, okay? In San Francisco, during my tenure, violent crime actually went down. In LA County, during Jackie Lace's tenure, went up almost 30% countywide and about 50% in the city of LA. I know that you heard the chief of police, you know, in the last two years talking about crime down, but you have to... Look at the UCR numbers over the period of eight years, right? Property crime, which was driven in San Francisco by car, car break-ins, went up right before Prop 47 and stayed up for about five years. Less than 2% of all car break-ins led to a, an arrest. Every case that came to my office actually was prosecuted. When we had a new chief of police that came in two years ago that actually came from the LAPD and decided that the police department was going to investigate these cases again, we've had now a 20% reduction over two years. At the same time, incarceration rates in LA County were four times the level that San Francisco County. And we have a jail with vacancies somewhere between 20 and 30% every day. So you have to ask yourself a question. If the goal of incarcerating and prosecuting people is to reduce crime, then San Francisco County's approach was certainly more successful than LA County. That's when you get the rhetoric and you get the police union out of it, you know, they're putting a million dollars, putting a lot of garbage out there. Take all that stuff, look at the, look at the numbers without any filtering, right? So we were able to reduce crime at higher levels and we were able to do the lower intervention by the criminal justice system. Now, science and what are the, some of the things that we did, a lot of this was driven by really bringing researchers on board, started looking at things like, you know, how do, they, how do the brain develop for young people, for instance? So I became, not convinced, I guess, but I got educated to the fact that our brain is not fully developed until we're about 25. Mm -hmm. Right. For guys, it's probably around 50, mm. right? <laughs> you ladies develop much faster than we do. So then we follow the science, and we, uh, we develop a system for 18 and under. We should, you know, in California, you have two systems. You have a juvenile system, an adult system. 18, which is purely an artificial line. Uh, under 18, you're a juvenile, so we develop a fully restorative justice model for, uh, for juveniles. And by the way, we had already in San Francisco misdemeanors for juveniles. We were diverting them all to nonprofits. So we're not prosecuting misdemeanors uh, juveniles. And we saw actually that our misdemeanor, that actually our juvenile crime went down further than the state. We know that the state juvenile crime has gone down because demographically we're getting older. Okay? 
But even after all that, even if you did the statistical analysis, our crime for juveniles went down further uh, than it did just because of the demographic shift. What we did see is that you know, the violent crime that was left was very concentrated, very small group, and primarily there were kids of color. And we developed a restorative justice model. And we started with a control group. We brought in researchers, so we had completely randomized who went into the control group and who went into the restorative justice model. And what we saw after about three years into this was the kids that were in the restorative justice model were reoffending at around 12%. Kids that were in the traditional model were reoffending about 40%. And we defined reoffending as any arrest, by the way. We, want, we, took, we lowered the threshold. We didn't say convictions. We just want to be, we want to be really aggressive in our definition of recidivism. And we also found, actually, even the 12% that reoffended, generally they were reoffending at a lower level. And by the way, we only did this for serious crimes. Remember, we were diverting all the lightweight stuff. So we may have a kid that went in for armed robbery initially, and then when they got rearrested, they got rearrested for shoplifting. That was a win for me, right? Um, so then we eliminated the control group, and you know that's the way the system now, since 20, the beginning of 2019, all the kids go through that. We started a quasi-restorative justice model with the 18 to 25s, with really the goal of actually bringing the same system to the 18 to 25, but quite frankly, people in my office felt that that was a good way to get recall if I did that for the 18 to 25. We have a little more uh, patience, I guess, for under 18. As soon as people cross that threshold somehow, we have been anointed with a whole bunch of wisdom and we forget what science tells mm -hmm. us, right? Um, so. Um, so we have used science in brain development science to help us in this. We also use science in order to try to reduce the impact of implicit bias into our work. So I know that there's a lot of talk about training and implicit bias, and I, you know, initially we bought into that narrative. We brought in trainers to talk about implicit bias, and then eventually I talked to some researchers and said, you know what, you can train the hell out of people. You can raise awareness, but you're never going to take implicit bias out of it, right? On that point, I want you to share with, with uh, folks who are here something that was novel, I'd never heard of taking place in any other DA's office before yours that would help address the problem of implicit bias. Um, you know, the, the bias that goes on at the level of the cognitive unconscious, and it happens across racial groups. It happens across any demographic category you can come up with. Um, what were some of, what was the Yeah, so, so I mean, initially I bought in the concept of training. Oh, if we train everybody, we have constant training, eventually we're gonna get rid of the evil thing that happens that we don't see it, but it happens anyway. And we, you know, we spent a little money, we bought some of the best trainers in the system, people that are really passionate, believe in the stuff. But then I also got a little restless and I started asking other people on the other side, what do you think about training people out of implicit bias? And you know, there's a whole other bunch of people that say, you can raise awareness, you can make people think about it, but you're not gonna take it out, right? It would be like for me to take your brains and suck them out, put them in the washing machine and put them back in and give you a whole new brain. That's not gonna happen, right? So really then I became very restless about how do we develop a system that will take that away, right? And uh, I'm a very technologically driven person, not that I'm personally technologically myself, but I believe in technology and good data, and good data, underlying good data, not garbage data, but good data, and science, and we, again, I believe in universities and researchers, so we invited, we have Stanford very close to us, we did a lot of work with the Stanford Law School, so hey, why don't we do, some work with the computational lab. So we brought in the people that run the computational lab and I said, do you think we can create artificial intelligence to help us mask race and other proxies for race from police work? And they look at me and said, piece of cake. I said, like, oh, really? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I mean, we can do, I mean, we can develop you know, artificial intelligence. If you got the right language, we can do anything with written reports. We can take it, we can add it, we can twist it. God knows Facebooks know how to do this stuff really well. The Russians really made a mm. science out of it, right? And uh, so they said, we can do it. And I said, okay, so how long would it take you? And so well, we don't know. I said, can you do it in 90 days? And they, everybody got rid of it. And they said, how much money do you have? And I said, I don't have any money. <laughs> uh, but you know what I did? I really, I really poked in their, their, their passion for, for righteousness and for doing the right things. I said, look, 
we know that African Americans get disproportionately impacted by the criminal justice system. And I don't necessarily believe that my people are racist. I certainly don't consider myself a racist, but I think that our work gets impacted by our biases. By the way, understanding, and because it's important to the background, we had already had um, the University of Chicago and UC Berkeley do an analysis of our work and whether our work was impacting racial disproportionality. And their conclusion was actually that in San Francisco District Attorney's Office, at least in 2015, after they cleaned up the data, spent two years, said, you guys are not doing anything intentionally that is out there in this. You know, you're receiving, you're receiving work from the police department, you're taking what comes up, and you simply keep down the assembly line going. But while you're not doing anything that is desperate, you're disproportionately impacting the work because you continue to take the work that is being handed to you. So what I wanted to do is I want to take one step further. OK, how do we at least try to reduce the disproportionality any of what that may be impacted by our work? And we did the training on implicit bias. And then I, I kind of had the journey where I came up to the, It's important to talk about it, by the way. You should know that it exists. But I want to create some bumpers that are go beyond awareness. And then so that's the conversation with the computational lab. And I sort of got them to buy into it, and, and they did. In about 90 days, they actually created a prototype that we tested, and basically what it did is it masked all race and race proxies, right? Because it's not only race, but you know, a name, a location, right? How many, I mean, how many Juan Hernandez are, are, are white Caucasians of Anglo-Saxon extraction? I'm mm -hmm. sure there are a few, but not too many, right? So there are certain names, you know, names are gonna be associated with race, they're gonna be associated with neighborhoods, zip codes are going to be associated with race. So we actually develop a, 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 a uh, algorithms and artificial intelligence would mask a police report completely. The prosecutor then makes the first decision based on the evidence other than the other stuff that will become necessary later, like photos and video. And then the system actually locks your first decision. So once you say, I'm moving forward or not, uh, it locks it, so you cannot erase it. It goes into the system, locks up. Then you unmask, and then you see videos, and you see photos, and you see zip codes, and all this stuff, and you may or may not go in the same direction. And so one of the legitimate reasons for going in a different direction, let's say you have an armed robbery, and you have three witnesses, and it says typically is, by the way, eyewitnesses are the worst mm -hmm. form of identifying anybody. First of all, cross-racial identification, scientifically proven that it doesn't work very well. If you're an African American, you're gonna have a hard time identifying an Asian person. If you're a white person, you're gonna have a hard time identifying African Americans, and it, cross, it impacts all races. Cross-racial identification, there's science now that says it's problematic. But even when you have interracial eyewitness identification, it's still problematic, right? Our brains are functioning fast in 100 different directions. So a typical robbery comes up, you have three witnesses, somebody's gonna describe the person as a light complexed Latino, five foot 10, 160 pound. Another person gonna describe it as a, oh, I'm sorry, dark complexed Latino, somebody's gonna say light complexed African American, mm -hmm. six foot tall, 200 pounds, and somebody else is gonna say God knows what. And the DA looks at it and says, well, I can't file the case with this, right? Because I'm gonna have so many contradictions here. So they say, uh, we're not moving forward. Then you unmask the, the report, and now you have a video that shows the store showing the robbery, and, and lo and behold, you got a green person with a gun committing the robbery, and you have a green person in custody, and it happens to be the same green person. So now the DA says, yeah, we can move forward with the case. Now you explain it, you have supervisory approval. That will be a legitimate reason for going against your original decision. The system, again, locks up each step. So you cannot go back. And then we actually said, we're gonna make this available to researchers, public policy, the group, you know, the public. We want full transparency, you know, after we do all this. A reason that would be illegitimate would be, now you unmask it and you happen to see the purple person and say, you know, purple people usually commit armed robberies. Therefore, this is a purple person. Therefore, this must be a robbery, mm -hmm. right? That would not be a good reason, right? Uh, so we're the first in the country, the only one so far, um, into the first year. So there's a lot to be learned from it. 
but that was really my thought approach to, to getting to try to deal with race and the impact of the work on race. A lot to learn. I'm not sure that that will be the ultimate, you know, it's a continuing journey, but it's at least trying to create uh, bumpers around the impact of race in our work. Um, we also did a lot of work about automated record expungement. You know, we work on Prop 64, with the legalization of marijuana, but then um, recognize that a lot of the people who are impacted by the war on drugs will never seek the relief that the law allows. So then we uh, started to do the work ourselves, actually announced that we were proactively going to um, provide for the relief. Under Prop 64, if you were convicted of a misdemeanor or drug-related, it, it could be sponged, and if you were a felony, it could be reduced to a misdemeanor. Um, we started doing the work by hand and recognized it was going to take forever. I tried, I did a press conference, I figured I'm going to get a lot of VAs behind this. Not one of them came up. In fact, Jackie Lacey said, you know, I would if I could, but I don't have the resources. Um, about a year into it, uh, we have clear about 800 records really working by hand. Uh, at the same time, we started working on Code for America, kind of similar to the computational lab. We said, hey, can you create an algorithm for us that will do this. It took about a year to do it. We had to cross a lot of thresholds with DOJ and access to information. But when we did in about 10 minutes, we uh, clear about roughly 8,500 records. 8,500? 8,500. Just turn the switch off and on. And so then we went out publicly with it. Um, and then we kind of egged uh, Yaki Lacey to do it. She refused. And then, you know, being as crafty as I am, I called the LA Times and brought it to their attention. They did a very nasty editorial. And then now Jackie Lacey goes around talking about how she automatically cleared records. She forgets to tell you that she actually refused to do it uh, until she was forced to do it. You know, Mr. Gascon, I want to re return um, briefly. This is connected to that, um, to the implicit bias and the way that can affect our moral judgments of wrongdoers, assuming we have wrongdoers, which we do have plenty, sadly, but how do we make moral judgments of them and how harshly do we condemn them and what actions do we take against them? I'm thinking particularly about the death penalty. Right. Yeah. And the fact that in eight years, the current incumbent uh, DA has only brought death penalty cases and gotten them against people of color. And this segues with some of my work because I think a lot about how we make differential moral judgments of people as a function of the racial their, own, their own racial identity. We judge black hearts more harshly than similarly situated non-black hearts yep. or white hearts. And a um, colleague, uh, Jennifer, Eberhard up at Stanford was able to establish that not only are blacks deemed more death worthy than whites who committed the same kind of crime, but the darker you are, the more death worthy you're right. deemed. This is one of the reasons I call a lot of my work, and I use the provocative language, nigger theory, because we do that. We, we make, we niggerize criminals and otherize them in that way. And it's easier to morally condemn them and write them off as just so much toxic human waste to be dumped and forgotten when we do that. Um, in approaching the death penalty and thinking about that record of all people of color being uh, found death worthy in LA County over the last eight years, what is your thinking about the death penalty and how would you approach it as a, as yeah. a DA? Let, let me, full disclosure, I'm, I'm against the death penalty. So everything that I tell you, understand that it's colored by uh, my conclusion that the death penalty is morally wrong. Okay, so I, full disclosure. But let's, let's try to be as objective as a, as a person that is very biased can be in this issue. Um, the purpose of the criminal justice system is to make us safer by deterring bad behavior, by controlling bad behavior, hopefully by managing um, a, you know, a system, managing resources and allocating resources thoughtfully, and by being just, right? So when we take the death penalty, let's begin by being really upfront about it. And if anybody has different numbers out there, please let me know because I'm not aware of it. All the science and all the numbers indicate that punishment, and certainly the death penalty, is not a deterrent, right? Some person that 
ends up killing someone, unless they're a psychopath, they're not thinking about the consequences of that behavior, right? You just don't think about it, right? So it's not a deterrent. Um, secondly, um, it's very costly, right? You can, you can do a lot of work with the cost of a single death penalty case, right? Work that actually would have more meaningful impact in the system. So it's not, economically, it's not good. Uh, then you look at the discriminatory practices, right? It's mostly impacting one class of people, poor black people, mostly, and then Latinos at a lesser extent. So it's not just. Right? I mean, the justice part of it is in. And then, you know, we haven't figured out how to bring somebody back to life after we kill them. Right? So it's irreversible. Right? Once, once the heart completely stops, I know there, you know there are some exceptions to that, but they happen very quickly. But the reality is that we intentionally make your heart stop by whatever behavior we use. You're not coming back. Right? And guess what? The system is not infallible, right? The system makes mistakes. We have seen over and over again wrongful convictions. And again, they mostly, not always, by the way, I happen to know some white people that have been wrongfully convicted, but mostly the people that get wrongfully convicted happen to be African Americans first, then other poor people, right? So you got a system that is unjust as it is applied. You have a tool that doesn't impact public safety one way or the other. And then you have a tool that if you get it wrong, it goes really, really wrong. Because there's no fixing to it. So I don't know how anybody morally can anymore say that the death penalty is a viable tool at any time. And I know that the incumbent in LA County says, well, we only apply it 3% of the time. But guess what? All 3% of the time happen to be Poor people of color, 21 out of 22 happen to be black. Um, doesn't fix anything, so it's purely for what? For punishing? Which, by the way, that office does believe. They train on punishment. And I know this because I've talked to them. Um, I don't believe that morally the, the government gets to punish people. I don't think that's the role of government. And I know that I'm probably giving you a concept that some of you may disagree. But I don't think that's our role. Our role is to intervene. Our role is to hold people accountable. Our role is to protect other people. But our role is not to punish, right? Because the concept of punishment then brings a whole other aspect to the work. That's why we send people to prison for 100 years, or 40 years, 60 years. You know, most of this, the other industrialized nations in the world generally don't send people to prison, even for the worst crimes, no longer than 20 years. And if you're going to stay more than 20 years, then it's a year by year based on your behavioral and your mm -hmm. dangerousness, not because of your original sentence. And if you go back to the thing that I was telling you, that two things occur. 95% of the people get released. And every year in custody, it will going to get, increase your criminogenic factors by 4 to 7%. Then you have to start questioning the value of extended sentencing. Right? And by the way, the things that I'm telling you, also there are other democracies out there that have gone in a different direction, right? You know, Portugal decriminalized drugs 22 years ago, 23 years ago now. Drug use has gone down. Violence has gone down. Incarceration has gone down. Death has gone down. While we were doubling down, they went the other direction. The rest of the European, the, the, the European Union in the last 10 years have basically decriminalized drug use. Germany has open prisons. And, you know, people are like, well, you know, Germany is a homogenic white country. Well, it's not. I don't know how many of you have been to Germany in the last 10 years. I was in Berlin less than a year ago. Berlin looks like L.A. The only difference is, like, black people in Berlin are not German, African Germans or whatever. You know, they're Africans from Africa. They just drop off the boat and they're refugees, right? They don't have any more criminogenic factors than the rest of the population that is comparably socially placed and, you know, your economic stance and all that. So the whole concept that if you're black, you're more likely to be a criminal is it's not based on science or anything. 
They have a bunch of people from other parts of Europe, Eastern Europe, right? Which, by the way, socially, they're looked upon as, mm -hmm. as we looked upon in this country, Italians and Irish in the late 1800s. Well, Irish in the late 1800s, Italians in the early 1900s, right? Because I, I find the, 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 the other part of this that is, you know, now that we have this anti-Latino, anti-Mexican sentiment around, I, I laugh about it because you could almost take uh, newspaper articles from the late 1800s and take the Irish out and put Mexican and you're in the same place or go into the early 1900s and take Italian out. But now it's the Irish and the Italians that discriminate mm -hmm. <laughs> against the Latinos. Like every class has to think they're a little better when, when they get integrated. Unfortunately for African Americans, because of the color of your skin, you never, you never, you never get a full break, right? Mm -hmm. But you have other countries that are equally diverse in, in racial makeup, economic makeup, and all this stuff. They treat people differently. They're much more humane about the way they treat people, and they get better results. We don't have a monopoly on good things. In fact, often we don't. So the things that I'm telling you also, they're based also in, in traveling and looking around and looking at other places and sure, search for a different answer, right? You know, we have a history that's driven and we will never check this out, certainly not in my generation or yours, the byproduct of slavery. It's, it's real, right? It's real. It's uncomfortable as hell to talk about slavery. But you know, policing in this country started to do what? In many parts of the South. Catch slaves. It's to catch slaves and bring them back. And then after the Civil War, it was to keep black people in their place. Right? Those vestiges, we have to admit that they're there and they're still real in our society. And I know it makes people extremely uncomfortable. But you know, unless we get out of our comfort zone, we cannot get to a better place. It's true for all human conditions. How many of you are runners? Any runners here? Okay. You gotta go through the pain, right? If you wanna get faster, if you're a competitive runner, you know that you're gonna be out of the comfort zone. If you're gonna run a marathon, which, you know, I don't know why people do that. I did it once, <laughs> never do it again. <laughs> But you know there's going to be pain and suffering in the preparation for that, the, the discomfort, right? But the goal was I wanted to run a marathon. If we want to get better as a society and become a more equitable society, we're going to first of all have to rip the scab and admit that we have a problem, and that will be painful for all of us. But hiding it and putting it away like it doesn't exist doesn't fix the problem. And our criminal justice system is the center, the epicenter, of a lot of these inequities because they happen in other places, right? But they come in here and this is where we mix them and we hammer them, right? And we are toxic. People that get arrested and prosecuted never do better with time. It's a traumatic impact that even if you somehow recover from it, if you talk to anybody who's done any prison or jail time, they will tell you that even if now they have a job and they have a normal life, as you can see in the exterior, there are scars, there are internal scars that never go away. And if you add to those internal scars the belief that you were treated unjustly because of what you look like, those scars really are deep. They're emotional scars that never go away. So how do we get to a better place? We get to a better place by, by having this conversation and turning a system in a different direction. And it will never be perfect. You know, it's a journey, right? But Ms. we have to admit to it. Mr. Gascon, I'm going to open the. I'm going to open to more questions. I think that's a great place to open to um, some more questions. Say, going in, number one, uh, when I've had Larry Krasner and other speakers come through, uh, they often have been coming from other jurisdictions, and they haven't actually been running for office at the time. We do have a, a speaker who is very knowledgeable, but also running for office at the same time. We do not endorse as a law school any candidate. We are nonpartisan. You all know me. I'll, I, I'm showing up at Federalist Society events. I'm over here hanging out with Newt Gingrich. I'm kind of all over the political spectrum because as I tell my students, you have to be able to write a brief for the other side that's more eloquent than they can write and then take on that brief. 
right? We always have to be going beyond our partisan boundaries, right? This has primarily been a conversation about substance, though, in the, in the, in the, in the carry on of my conversation with Larry Krasner and my own scholarship through the years on how we can rethink criminal justice policy. So, I, I, but I do want to just make that clear. I re really appreciate all the substantive remarks that we've been get, able to get into, and I'd like to open it now to any questions from uh, the, the audience. Um, I think you're, uh, thank you for coming, by the way, Mr. Gascona. Is, it's Mr. now, right? <laughs> George. George. Please. Okay. Um, thank you for coming. I think the last thing you were saying about talking about the origins of uh, police departments really is a good transition into something that I don't really think we've touched on, which is police accountability. Um, and while you were DA in San Francisco, um, there were a few people who were shot by police, but one that I remember particularly is Mario Woods, yep. who, which I, probably a lot of people may not remember, um, a young black man standing uh, with his back against a wall, holding a knife, I believe, uh, yes. but surrounded by police officers with guns drawn who, um, it executed him at that point, uh, right. basically by firing squad. Yep. Um, at the, and at the time, you couldn't bring charges against those officers because you said the standard wasn't, the appropriate uh, legal standard wasn't in place that the case would have gone nowhere. So now we have, as of January 1st, we have a new uh, lower standard to be able to bring charges in the state against police officers. So I wanted to ask, do you think you'd be able to, um, had, had you had that standard at the time, would you have been able to bring charges against those officers? Mm -hmm. And do you think that the standard we have now would be sufficient if you are become DA to hold police officers accountable in Los Angeles? Yeah, and you're more optimistic than I am, by the way. Mm -hmm. I don't think the new standard, I think it's watered down. In fact, if you talk to police defense lawyers, I would tell you, they tell the unions, don't worry about it. Everything is the same, and I agree with them. Uh, on the other hand, I was the only supporter from law enforcement, the only DA out of 58 DAs in the state that supported Dr. Weber's first bill, which would have brought the threshold of police use of deadly force, actually all force, but deadly force specifically, to minimum and necessary, mm -hmm. right? Which would require actually that the officer looks for alternatives, including walking away, waiting, doing other things that we know actually will reduce the likelihood to have to use force, which the law doesn't require today. It didn't under Mario Woods. But let's, a quick journey through the law because I think, you know, since most of you are wanting to be lawyers, let, let's understand what the state of the law is because most civil lawyers don't understand it. And I tell you, some of my friends on the defense side also don't understand. And I know this because I've studied this, but not only that, we have actually brought in actually an alumni from the school, Erwin Chemerinsky, who runs Bolt Hall now, and I've given cases to him and said, Erwin, who's a personal friend, tell me how we can prosecute the case. And after weeks, he comes back and says, you don't have a path, okay? We, if you kind of go back constitutionally, when we started in the late 1800s, we created a system that basically most crimes were a felony, and most crimes that were a felony were capital offenses, which meant the death penalty was on the table all the time. Yeah, in the Old West, we used to hang people up for stealing horses, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's the origins, right? We also created, you know, very driven by the West. I remember people got really upset when we had the, the case in Florida and stand your grounds in Florida and those southern states. And I'm laughing and say, what are you talking about? We have a stand your ground in mm -hmm. California. It's not a constitution. You don't have to walk away. Somebody threatens you and you can stand your ground and even though that recently you can step over there and, and everything will go away. You don't have to. You can fight. You can fight and escalate to whatever is reasonable and it applies to police officers too, right? So when you combine that uh, we had a system that basically most felons were capital, which gave basically law enforcement the capacity to, you know, if necessary, if people were running away and they were deemed to be accused of, alleged to have done those things that were capital, well, you can, you know, you can do away with the jury, the judge, and all that stuff. You can do an execution in the street, right? Now, the law has evolved, right? So we no longer shoot running burglars when they're running away. But by the way, that wasn't that long ago. In the 1970s, LAPD used to shot burglars as they were running away, right? And it was perfectly lawful. We've sort of evolved from there to the point that now we're talking about a few crimes. We're talking about robberies. We're talking about murder or attempt murder. We're talking about rape or sexual assaults, right? So if you still 
police officer comes to a call and they, you know, armed robbery just occurred, somebody's running away from you, and depending on the circumstance, you say, you know, this person could continue to be a dangerous because they're armed, like, you can shoot him, you tell him stop, he doesn't stop, you shoot him, it's a good shoot. Lawful shoot, maybe not a good shoot, right? You have somebody already engaged in conduct that was likely to cause death or great bodily injury, and they still have some capacity to do that, as the case of Mario Woods, right? Mario Woods has stabbed somebody before, lightly, right? The cops came in with a call saying, we have a man with a knife that already injured someone. They're following him. They're telling him to stop. The video that you saw, same video that I saw and thousands of other people saw, the officers basically decided, we're not gonna let you walk anymore. Uh, you have to believe the officers for what they tell you because you don't have anywhere else to go. You know, the officer that decided to step in front of him, which by the way, not that it matters, it was an African-American officer, right? Said, I was fearful that there were kids behind me and that this guy was gonna continue to pose a threat. So I decided that this was the line. Mario Woods took a few steps in his direction. You can see he's really stumbling. I'm not even sure there's steps. Right, he stumbled, he still has a knife. First officer fires. Every other officer in the firing squad says, I am fearful for the life of my brother officer. So the first officer fires because I'm fearful for what could happen behind me. Everybody else is fearful what happens here. They end up shooting Mario Woods 20 sometimes, right? You see it in the video and you say, was this shooting necessary? I think most reasonable people would say not. Was it lawful under the law then and probably lawful under the law today? Definitely then. I would argue that today probably so. It's a little murky. That may be a case that we would take up today and see how the courts treat it. But we're rolling the dice, right? Because the courts may come back and give us a good decision or not. Because, you know, a case like that, if you get a conviction, it's not going to stop there, right? It will be the kind of case that will be appealed. Um, so we still haven't gotten to the place where we say unequivocally police use of force should only be the absolutely necessary and minimum force in order to accomplish a lawful law enforcement mission. So the Mario Woods case is an illustration of the problem with the law. By the way, interestingly enough, the police thinks that I'm after then, and I did. I prosecuted 22 police officers, some of them for use of force, but not necessarily for deadly force. In fact, we, I tell people, we had a case of Alameda County deputies that drove in a vehicle pursuit of a carjacking into San Francisco. We got the video. For those of you that remember the Rodney King, how many of you remember the Rodney King video? Mm -hmm. Okay, this video is... 10 times worth. Okay, this guy is literally, you can hear it begging, don't hit me anymore. We counted 23 or 24 blows. You could say maybe the first two or three blows were justified, maybe the 10th, the guy may be going for a weapon, we don't think so, but, but by the time you get to the 23rd or 22nd, enough is enough, right? But I tell people, because it was a carjacking, which is equivalent to a robbery, and because he was armed, or they believe he was armed, actually. He turned out not to be armed. He had a knife, but he didn't have it by the time he got out of the car. Have he run away, the officer chased him and shot him in the back and killed him, there would not be a trial. We have a trial, actually, because I have a video, and we see the whipping going on. And at some point, we say, okay, enough is enough. Right. So the difference, though, between Jackie Lacey and me, and it's an important difference, she feels comfortable with the way the law is. She had a case where a chief of police actually brought a case to her and said, please prosecute this case. Which, by the way, the chief of police showed me the case. And I said, this is a case that you could take. She said, no. She took two years and came up with a bunch of different excuses to say no. So the difference is, you know, who's comfortable with the law? Who's willing to step out and fight to get a different law in place? And I'll just point out that the... Um Justice Collaborative has a stat that speaks to that very point that uh, there, um, we witnessed in LA County 500 plus deaths by on-duty police officers or while in law enforcement custody over the past eight years, only one officer has been charged. Um, you remember the case of Marlene Pinnock, speaking of videos, on Santa Monica with the officer 
pummeling her repeatedly. Now that was a pretty graphic video. It looked awfully bad, but the DA's office said there was insufficient evidence to raise a triable issue of fact on that video standing alone. That's, uh, you may say that the officer didn't do anything wrong and the jury could come back with that conclusion, yeah. but to say that a reasonable jury could not find possibly any excessive force with that evidence is jaw dropping. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. And then we have some over here. Okay. Thank you. Um, just from that actual incident, what do you see it taking? Like, what kind of evidence do we need to collect in order to try cases like this? Like, that seems like the most clear evidence, what, what more do we need? Yeah, we, are you talking about the case on the freeway at Santa Michael Freeway or Mario Woods? I'm talking about this case where there is a blatant abuse of power and uh, use of force. The freeway. The freeway. Yeah, the freeway. That I, I think, you know, I, I would say that there is plenty of evidence to file that case. That case, Although not the same set of circumstances, it's kind of like the one that I was talking about, the Alameda County, right? We have video there, they're hitting this person. It goes beyond any, any reason for defense or defense of others. Uh, the Santa Monica case is more graphic, by the way, because this lady is absolutely not a threat to anybody. Uh, you know, under the current law, that's, in my opinion, it's a very prosecutable case. Now, could you find one juror out of 12 that disagrees and you hung a juror? Yeah, you can, but that's not, that cannot always be the the measure of how you take a case, you have to feel strongly that you have sufficient admissible evidence to convince 12 people recently. And if you do, then, you know, obviously you're thinking about beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, that are interplays, right? But you also, I think those are cases that are prosecutable. Hi, I'd love to hear more about the nature of the relationship between a progressive prosecutor and local law enforcement um, and how that compares to um, relationship between law enforcement and a more traditional tough on crime um, prosecutor. Really just want to know if, as a, pro as a progressive prosecutor, if you find that there has been pushback from law enforcement, is there not maybe as harmonious of a relationship as you think you see? I don't know. I don't know what I see. No, but no, no. <laughs> I mean, there, you raise a good point. There's been a lot of pushback, right? I mean, when car burglaries went up in San Francisco, for instance, 81,000 car, car break-ins, 13 arrests. And they were basically wanting to show me and, and let the public know that somehow it was my fault. We got a new chief of police. He came in a different direction, and we were able to turn that around. I think if you see uh, progressive prosecutors around the country, Larry Krasner is being attacked by police unions and by the U.S. Attorney, uh, Marilyn Mosby in Baltimore. Certainly mm -hmm. I was in San Francisco. I am now, right? The police union is putting over a million dollars, and that's just a down payment. They have actually promised to put at least another million dollar in the next two or three weeks to try to make sure that I don't get elected. Um, so there is a tension, but I think also as police, pro more progressive police think thinking takes place, I think the, there will be a, there is a, a coming of people coming together to collaborate, right? Um, and much like, you know, like, a shift in legislation or whatever. People may complain for a while, but after a while, okay, that's what I have, so I learned to work with that. Uh, there's no question that prosecutors need to work with the police, and I think good policing is important to society, and, and certainly I'm, a, you know, I'm not anti-police. You know, in fact, I am very pro-police. I am anti-bad policing, and I define that as people that abuse power, whether it's physical or otherwise, have used their, their position of authority, uh, I don't consider that acceptable. But I think police officers that are trying to do the right things to, to keep a harmonious and safe community, uh, those folks are my friends and I will support them. Even if they don't like me, I like them, right? And I'm not saying that they don't, a lot of them like me. Um, but it's gonna be you know the friction because you have basically Look, we're, we're in the eye of the storm in criminal justice reform, right? We're in the middle of this place where a lot of, a lot of things are, you have generational overlay, right? I mean, there's some people that say that, that reform is always one funeral away, mm -hmm. right? Meaning you have to almost 
move into another generation, right, and hopefully then have the new generation contaminated by the old one. So, so we're in the middle of this mix, right? Unfortunately, I tell you what other does a lot of harm to what is going on, you got Jackie Lacey calling herself a progressive prosecutor, right? And a lot of people in her place are now doing that, right? It's become like the thing to say. And unless you're discerning enough to say, okay, you know, what are you doing that tells me that you're progressive? Because everything that she does is obvious, actually not, right? But, you know, it's hard for people to see, well, a black woman that says it's progressive is not progressive. How, first of all, how can a black person, I mean, now you're talking about implicit bias, even within the African-American community. I'm black, there's no way that I cannot be progressive. Just by definition, because I'm black, I'm progressive. Well, no, right? But some folks in the African-American community just cannot accept that Jackie Lacey, if you dress Jackie Lacey on the suit of a white person in their 60s or 70s, she out-Republican her predecessor. And hopefully I'm not offending any Republicans here. I know I'm in the middle of a Republican world here. <laughs> Uh, you know, I can say that in UCLA and get accolades. Here I'm going to get tomatoes uh. on my way. <laughs> uh. But, you know, it, so just because you happen to be in a suit that looks like a certain person because of the color of your skin doesn't necessarily make you, right? And, you know, so questioning that is going to be important because it impacts all those relationships on how people view each other. Yeah, I had Steve Cooley, who was her predecessor, yeah. by the way. I spoke, I had one of these conversations with him a few years back when he was still the DA. Um, and he is another USC Gould grad, along with Jackie, by yeah. the way, both uh, Gould grads. And um, I was on NPR with Jackie Lacey about, oh, two, three months ago, um, uh, press play with Madeline Brand and she claimed the progressive prosecutor oh. mantle, and oh. I had to just kind of gently point out her record yeah. and how, given that record, she was a pro progressive prosecutor only in a Pickwickian sense. Yeah. Um, so, but it is a catch buzz phrase yeah. that has been claimed by many now. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, so it's a little bit of a different topic. I do work with um, children that are, are alleged sexual abuse victims, and we've been told that very, very few of these cases ever make it to criminal trial and are never prosecuted because prosecutors want to run on a really high conviction rate, and they're hard to prove these cases. So I was wondering, in general, like the, the veracity of that type of claim, and then also what obligation we have if we're thinking about things like morally and ethically to also consider victims' needs, especially in a time when they're going to hear that it doesn't matter. Like, no one believes me, or it's not important that it happened to me. So. Yeah. yeah, you know, sexual assault certainly, again, is an area where this office has done very poorly, right? Uh, I mean, anywhere from Ed Buck, right, to Weinstein, which now is getting prosecuted for a couple of cases very conveniently as we're getting close to the primaries, uh, at the expense of maybe screwing up the New York case uh, by poisoning a jury pool. Um, but... First of all, there are cases that are hard to prove, undoubtedly, right? And, you know, the, the ethos of prosecution is, 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 is complex because on the one hand, you have even the American Bar Association tells you in their ethical guidelines for prosecutor, you should never file a case unless you believe that you can convince 12 people beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So you start from that way of thinking, even though the law doesn't require that, right? Um, and then you have the pressures of the culture of prosecutorial offices that your performance is often graded on your conviction rate or your filing rate and conviction rate, which then you know, creates an a, a, a apprehension to take a case that may be difficult to prove, which these cases are. I think it gets more complicated than that too, though. I think it gets down to the court of often culturally how we see the sexual relations between people, right? Especially uh, when we often think that, you know, uh, sexual conduct happens because there are two parties that somehow agree. And some people bring that to what I consider a real sick level down to a child, right? A 12-year-old girl was really somehow flirting and, and, you know, which is very sick, but that, that, you know, that plays again, you're talking about implicit biases and all that stuff. So you have, first of all, the, the legal realities of the ethics, 
Then you have the complexities of the culture. Then you have cultural nuances to it. And you get to the place that we get to, right, where very few prosecutions ever take place. More importantly, frankly, than the prosecutions, how do we deal, how do we create a culture of embracing survivors and providing the services that they need, which go beyond whether you prosecute a case or not? How do you treat survivors? What are the on-ramps to services? How do you um, reduce any kind of shaming or you know, cultural finger pointing? Um, how do you create a process that is trauma-informed, that is survivor-centered as opposed to prosecution center? And that's the place that we need to get to. And you know, it's a journey where I can tell you that in San Francisco, one of the things that I did after about two years, the head of a victim services was a lawyer. And I came, became convinced that you know, we don't get trained to, to know how to deal with trauma and all that stuff. So, we very gracefully helped this person get another management job, and then we brought in a clinical psychologist, someone actually had been published, had a, a great reputation in working in trauma-informed care, and she really turned our office upside down. I mean, she educated me. In fact, to this day, we wrote a policy paper that just got published on what I would do as a DA concerning women's and rape and all those things and sexual assault, and she was one of the contributors. Uh, but we created a trauma-informed survivor center approach to it. So the first thing that we did, we work with all of our partners in the ecosystem, including universities and colleges, and I'll get into that a little more in a second, but we want to create multiple on-ramps for people to report. They may not necessarily be the traditional police or prosecutor. We created on-ramps in working with medical facilities to make sure that survivors that came in to get a SART exam, you know, basically a, a rape kit that they were gonna be treated with a great deal of dignity and compassion. Uh, even if they were not ready to prosecute the case, which often you know, survivors aren't, we wanted to convince people that we wanna hold on to this evidence. And because if you evolve and you decide to prosecute, we should be able to have whatever tools we can. Uh, then you know, we owned up the responsibility of being the, the broker of services, you know, social services, housing, um, psychological services, you know, in the case of domestic violence or, you know, moving somebody, helping somebody get to a different place because they cannot stay in the same place. Um, so we started to approach the work not with an eye towards necessarily prosecution of the case. While that, you know, clearly we wanted to pre preserve evidence and for the survivor that wants to prosecute, we wanted to see whether it was a prosecutable case. But regardless, we wanted to be centered around the survivor in services and on ramps. And then we even came up, you know, we, we created actually an annual program. We started working with all the universities. How many of you have read, have heard about the red zone? Yeah, a couple of you. So the first freshman year class, first few weeks when you get into college, it's called the red zone. And the red zone is where most of your sexual assaults occur. Now there are a lot of sexual assaults in campus and you ladies here know what I'm talking about. I'm not, I'm not gonna ask anybody to raise your hand. But I know that each of you, if you haven't personally impacted, you at least know someone that has, right? Because we know the rate of sexual assault in campus is off the scale, mostly unreported. So when we created the Red Zone event, what we did is we actually had, we got to the point we signed MOUs with all the colleges and universities, and, this, um, and we had the police department agree and all the other law enforcement partners, school police, we got the hospital and civil, you know, some us nonprofits to agree that we would create, first of all, an educational process. So every year during the beginning of the freshman year, we go out and we do a press conference. We bring a lot of people. We have a lot of discussions uh, to raise awareness. We educate. We work a lot with both first responders and emergency room people to educate them about trauma center, survivor center services. And really with a gear, more than anything, geared towards prevention, number one. And number two, wrapping ourselves around and reducing the harm when it occurs. And then, thirdly, prosecution. We also work with Uber and Lyft, educating their drivers. I actually started a campaign. If you got somebody's coming, they jump into your car, they're clearly intoxicated. And there was someone else, you know. We actually worked, actually, we forced Uber during one of our lawsuits to, if you go on your Uber app now, and you can do it on Lyft, you can, when you jump in, you can tell them, 
You can tell a friend that you jump in and where you're going to go and they can track you. Okay, well, you can thank the San Francisco DA for that. That's happening now worldwide. Why? Because we wanted to give, especially women, the avenue to be able to tell a friend, hey, I should be arriving in 20 minutes. If I don't, by the time 30 minutes are up, call the police. And you can see basically where that car is, right? We work with bars and nightclubs to train bartenders to, to look for signs of potential uh, either excessive intoxication or, or drug facilitated activity that could lead to a sexual assault. So it's a complex world that we need to take it in different pieces, but there is no question that prosecution has a role. Quite frankly, when you have cases where you have multiple unconnected victims that are telling you the same story, the lie should go on at some point. Because guess what? On sexual assault, you can actually introduce patterns of conduct, right? Even though this other 10 cases I may not be able to prosecute, I can prosecute this one, I can bring this, right? So it's how do you work this so you, don't, you continue to look for ways, A, not to normalize the behavior in our culture and you know, get to a place that no is no, right? And getting drunk is not a license to whatever. Um, and, and it goes for both sides, by the way. I mean, it's educating the man, educating the woman. It takes two to tangle. And sometimes, if, obviously, in the LGBTQ relationship, I mean, frankly, we deal a great deal with sexual assaults in the LGBTQ community. And there are some similarities, and there are some dissimilarities, right? Talking about social stigma and even victims being more afraid to report, we had to do a lot of work around the, the LGBTQ community to educate people. It's okay, especially for guys to come out and say, it's okay to say you were raped. And that's not okay, right? And teach the police and emergency services. There's nothing dishonorable about a gay man getting raped. He, he, or, he is a victim. He is a, and he needs to be treated just as much as anybody else who is raped, right? So it's, it's going through that process that is, it's just as important, if not more important, actually, the prosecution of a case that may be hard to prosecute. Unfortunately, yeah, we're at the end. Uh, we'll, this will be the last question, and uh, we're going to have to call it quits after this. I just wanted you to speak to something that I don't hear often in this form is judicial responsibility. We often hear about police accountability, but what about judicial accountability? I don't know if you're familiar with, but there is a judge, who was a judge named Bruce Wright from the state of New York. He was dubbed Let Him Loose Bruce. And back in the 70s, he spoke very articulately and quite eloquently what you stated earlier and that before it was politically incorrect, the niggerization of the Justice Department, of the legal system. And as a judge, he actually did something. When black and brown people came before him, what he recognized is that one of the biggest pitfalls was the bail system. They could not move forward because they couldn't afford bail. If they couldn't afford bail, they couldn't even afford legal defense. So he lowered the bail to what he deemed was affordable for each person. And he spoke about how black and brown people are being perceived by judges with inherent biases. And he called each judge out and he received a great deal of backlash for it. Yeah. And this was in the 70s. We're now in 2020 and we're speaking about this now. And my concern is that each person here is going to go before a judge shortly in a year, two years, and they're gonna have the best brief. They're going to have great legal scholarship and they're gonna even point out to this judge, your honor, my client has never even been noticed. They haven't received proper service. And because that judge is going to look down at that client and see a wild afro, some dreadlocks, or hey, some, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> some butch-looking woman or tattoos, they're going to discount that because they have discretion. And what I'm concerned is that for all the drum and dang of Black Lives Matter and This Lives Matter, and we're talking about the police, and the district attorney, it doesn't matter because the, once they get in that courtroom, 
that judge who used to be an ex-police officer, used to be with the DA's office, um, who was only appointed and never had any litigation experience, but was appointed because his family donated to Gavin Newsom or Jerry Brown, or, and has very little legal experience or scholarly experience that you really need to have to be a judge, are making decisions about people's lives and giving these outrageous um, uh, sentences, which agree. I've lived in Europe. I just came back from Berlin also a year ago. And they, like you said, they do have open prisons, which seems more humane and much more progressive. And also putting a black judge or gay judge up there, using it for diversity's sake, when in fact, Jackie Lacey, we see Clarence Thomas, yep. many people um, we can go through are not Bruce Wright. But how, as a DA, or I know we have a commission on judicial performance, which is just a titular head, does absolutely nothing to really, how are we going to hold the courtrooms accountable? Because that's where the buck stops. Not in the streets, you can bring them, that's where it stops. And, and, and I've, uh, we're gonna have to have a relatively short response because yeah. people have been very patient. It's been such an engrossing conversation. I know why so many people are staying and maybe being a little late for some other things, so I appreciate that a lot. Um, I'm and thinking about the, 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 the role of the judge. When I was talking to Larry Krasner a little earlier uh, in the school year, he was pointing out how much trouble, resistance he was running into as a progressive prosecutor the with the bench. Yeah. Because a lot of people on the bench are themselves former prosecutors, and they're being told that your entire career has actually perhaps been misguided. The Overton window has shifted, and you're having to engage in some critical self-reflection about maybe some misconceptions you had, and it's an indictment perhaps of what you've been doing, and a lot of them find that very tough to swallow. Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you actually, I'll go more deeply on this. You know, Marilyn Mosley, who's a personal friend of mine in, in, in Maryland, and sorry, in Baltimore, or Kimber, uh, you know, Kimberly Hunter in St. Louis, the bench is actually attacking these two prosecutors. Uh, the bench is the one that is going after them. In case of Kim, they're trying to take her bar card. Um, so look, I mean, the bench is no different than the prosecutors and the cops, right? We're all, we all are products of the same world. Uh, the only difference, you know, somebody works a black robe and, you know, they got anointed because of whatever they run or they were anointed. I think the only area that I'm going to disagree with you is that the buck actually stops with the prosecutor because the prosecutor is the one that really drives the system. First of all, they're the ones that determine whether you're going to go in front of the judge. And secondly, because of the way the laws are today, really, the prosecutor really kind of frames the argument for the judge. You know, if I don't file three strikes, the judge doesn't get to throw three strikes in the case. If I don't file a special circumstances, the judge doesn't get to add special certs. If I don't put status uh, enhancements, the judge doesn't get to add them. So actually the prosecutor can have a tremendous amount of control in shaping what comes in. Now true that the judge at the end of the day is gonna apply his or her own personal biases. No question about it. But so much of what occurs, it occurs way before it gets there. So I think that actually the prosecutor can drive more of that. Now, moving forward, what are the things that we can do? We have to think of diversity beyond race mm -hmm. and gender. We have to think mm -hmm. about diversity, also diversity of thought. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, when we were hiring lawyers in San Francisco, and now you know, about half of them I hired during my period of time, we were intentional about race and gender, by the way, and we actually, it was a Stanford did an analysis of all 58 counties. We were the most diverse office in the state of the large counties in terms of gender and race. We were a majority of women, majority of women in management, majority of women in executive roles. But beyond that, you have to be very careful that you equate race mm -hmm. with diversity of thought. I have to tell you that I actually had to let some minority lawyers encourage them to leave the office because they would not get on with the program, right? So when we're moving to the bench, just simply marking the black box or the brown box or the female box, it's not enough. It's looking for people that are gonna go there and they're going to reflect the values of an evolving community. And they are going to be willing to stand up to a DA, willing to stand up to law enforcement, say, 
you know, what's wrong is wrong. And I'm going to go in a different direction. Yeah. I know we're out of time, so I hear you. This has been terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.